In C++, it is standard to split up your class declarations and class definitions into two separate files, the header, or the .hpp file, and the source, or the .cpp file. One of the good things about this is that you can get a high-level overview of what a class contains and does, or the interface, from peeking at the header file, while the more in-depth implementation, the actual logic of the code, is hidden in the source files. When you want to create a new class, you need to get into the habit of creating a header file and a source file, usually matching the class's name. So here, I have a class called cat, and I've named the file cat.hpp. The HPP file contains the class declaration, the function declarations, and the variable declarations. The CPP file contains the function definitions. If we're using our custom class in any source file, any CPP file, we need to include the .hpp file for the class that we're using. However, we don't need to include a .cpp file. Those are automatically just part of the program. Inside of the header file, you'll declare your class as well as its member variables and functions. If your class declaration uses any special libraries, you'll also need to include them in the file as well. Here, we are using a string variable, so we need to include the string library. And surrounding the code in your header file, you'll need to add some special stuff that might look confusing right now. See, if we include this header file from multiple source files, we could get a compiler error saying that we're redeclaring the class. To make sure the compiler doesn't think we're declaring our class multiple times, we have to add these preprocessor statements. Preprocessor statements begin with the pound sign, just like our pound include. For now, just keep this memorized. Whenever you create a class, at the beginning of the file put pound sign, if in def, and then some unique identifier, so usually I use the class name in all caps with a underscore at the beginning. It has to be unique, so there's no naming conflict. Then, right below that, write pound defined, and then the same keyword, whatever you put. And then at the very end of the file, put pound end if. Basically, it says that if this class name is not defined, we need to define the class name. And at the very end is the end if statement. So if the compiler tries to read this file, and it's already found this class name before, it's not going to re-add this class to our program. So it won't say that it's re-declared, because it's already been declared. If you don't add the pound if and def define in such and such, you might get a build error similar to this, redefinition of your class. This means that the compiler is reading the class declaration multiple times, so it thinks you're declaring it multiple times. In your class's source file, this is where you actually define your functions. You add the function bodies and the internal code. You just need to make sure to include any libraries that you're using, and any of your own .hpp files that you're using as well. Usually, this is at least the class's header file. See the second class lecture for more on how to define a function outside of the class declaration using the scope resolution operator. Remember how we keep writing using namespace std at the beginning of all of our programs? Without that line, we would have to prefix any commands or objects we're using from the sender library with std and then the scope resolution operator, or two colons. C out, C in, string, end l, and others are all parts of the std namespace in the C++ standard library. A namespace is a way to store a set of code under a special label, or a special name. If we're using libraries from multiple locations, there's a chance that there could be a naming conflict. That is, two libraries could potentially use the same name for their own functions or classes. So, we can use namespaces to mitigate this by specifying exactly where our functions and classes are coming from. We can write our own namespaces simply by using the namespace keyword followed by our namespace's name, then surrounding the code between with curly braces. Any code between the curly braces are in the namespace. Also, the namespace specification should go around both the class declaration in the .hpp file and the function definitions in the cpp file. 
then we would either need to prefix any usage of this class with the namespace's name, or write using namespace and then your namespace name at the beginning of the program, just like we do with using namespace std. So what's with all these rules and features? Why even bother using classes? And why aren't we keeping it simple? Classes are a very powerful aspect of object-oriented programming. Programs are very infrequently simple, and they can get quite large and may even need to be maintained for years or decades. Being able to structure our code in a logical manner allows us to better maintain the code and hopefully keep it cleaner. There are a few things to keep in mind when designing classes. Encapsulation refers to restricting access to the internals of a class or object, as well as designing the class so that there is an interface that an outside user or programmer has access to for that class, usually the public member functions. We utilize public, protected, and private characterizations of our internal members, variables and functions, in order to define how our class is to be used and how it works behind the scenes. Information hiding is related to encapsulation, and is also about hiding the inner workings of an object from the user or other programmers. This is because the inner workings may need to change later on, but the user only needs to know what the function or the object does, not how it does it. By having the public functions available to the user or programmer, we can change the code behind the scenes but still offer the same functionality. Abstraction is about reducing duplicate code in the long run by creating generic objects that can be reused and repurposed for different items. For example, a generic list that can store any data type within. It is about creating a structure around our data. How do we design a piece of software that handles our data meaningfully? We abstract a problem by writing functions and objects, and by utilizing features of our language to make our software generic, such as by using templates or polymorphism, which will be covered in later lectures. For example, let's say we have an image file. Each pixel of the image has a red, green, and blue value, and each RGB value is in order in a 2D grid. We could write a class or set of functions that knows how to load and save these image files. Later, somebody could use your class to make a program that will load an animation, as a series of your image files for each frame. So, you've abstracted loading to make it easier, and someone else has abstracted the problem of animating by extending your work for an animation tool. There is a lot to read, in books, blogs, and articles, and more, about good software design and principles. It is good to become somewhat acquainted with these concepts in order to become a good software developer. Software design can be a very logical and very creative process, and if that's your cup of tea, it can be a lot of fun.